Okay, it's 1.34 p.m. on Thursday, February 25th, 2016. Welcome to the AMATS Policy Committee meeting. Uh, we'll start out with roll call. The meeting's called to order. Would you like me to do that? Would you do the roll call, Cindy, please? did you start, did you hit the record button? Yes, I did. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so Ms. Heil. Here. Ms. Witt. Here. Mayor Berkowitz. Here. Mr. Flynn. Present. Mr. Steele. I'm here. And Mr. Peterson. Present. Here as the alternate, so we have a quorum. Okay, thank you. And uh, before you, I have uh, included the um, public notice or the press release uh, announcing our new regional director. Uh, the announcement was made the day of our last policy committee meeting. And Dave sends his regrets that he's not here today. He had to testify before the Senate Transportation Sub Finance Senate Finance Transportation Subcommittee today, um, having to do with facilities and shared services. Uh, so he'd probably rather be here. <laughs> he probably <laughs> would be rather. Yes, and actually, Dave is uh, carrying on a lot of his duties from his previous position as as facilities, uh, being in charge of uh, uh, facilities statewide. And uh, he's also working on the, uh, with the administration on sharing services for facilities, development, maintenance. Um, and so he's, he's actually still wearing, he's very much wearing two hats. But I, I think the municipality would be interested in knowing that he spent several years in Alaska as a public works director and, um, and, and also in, uh, uh, in charge of utilities there. And so he has a lot of good experience from a local government perspective, which is unusual, I think, for... And they did good work out there. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 have, they, have place, yeah, they have money. They have money. So he knows, he knows tiny. Ch challenging <laughs> conditions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, tiny, Frank Kelty. Cutter was tiny. <laughs> He's better than me. He probably knows. For everybody there, I imagine. Uh, okay. Approval of the agenda. Any changes? Any so objection to approving it? I'll move to approve the agenda. Second. No objections. It's passed, and I we need to go back up to the public involvement announcement, Greg. Right? All AMATS meetings are public meetings and the public is invited to comment. If we have a business item, we'll have a presentation by staff or a consultant and then the committee will be given a chance to discuss it and then at that point the public will be invited to comment on that. Thank you. And can I just ask that uh, Lori, the person who does our minutes, is uh, in another meeting right now, so she clearly isn't here taking our minutes. So if, when uh, anyone talks, make sure you uh, announce loudly who you are and if your last name is a challenging name to spell it for our records. And uh, I'll, I'll take good notes here so we know which ones, the mo mo motions and seconds, so we get those. Thank you. Okay, we have three sets of minutes. Uh, that we received last month and we needed a little bit more time to look at it. Uh, the first one is the November 19th uh, minutes. Move to approve. I'll second. The discussion? Yeah, well, Madam Chair, I have a couple of, of, of uh, changes on page eight. And it could have been that I misspoke. It could have been that the uh, vernacular of transportation world is sufficiently confusing that things got mixed up, but uh, if it's about halfway down the page, um, it speaks to my comment saying, mention, uh, mention that AMATS has short-term, long-term, and illustrative, and asked how these go from, and it says short-term to illustrative, I think that should actually read illustrative into short-term, skipping over long-term. And then similarly, down below my next comment, uh, I, uh, speaking to my state of mind, how he is confused as to, the, as to how the jump from illustrative over the long-term project already ahead of them in the queue and into short-term. And I've actually marked it up and will hand it to my notes to Mr. Lyon to pass along. I think that is more accurate than flex, at least reality, if not what I said. <laughs> okay, thank you. So do we adopt the changes first? I would move those changes, Madam Chair. Second. 
Yeah, so as, as you know, Madam Chair, we brought this up at our last meeting, and there were a couple of uh, questions and uh, <coughs> some edits, etc. And what we've done is, you, you still have your full lovely document in front of you, but the two smaller ones with the yellow highlights behind it include uh, those changes. So you have... Uh, just to make it easy instead of you're digging around and if you approve those then we'll add them into the to the pile there so it makes sense I should say I'm trying to remember which one is which I think table 5.6 is the CMP okay so this table 5.6 is for the big document for the CMP so we can look at those first um, the, question was, or we talked about the ITS projects and uh, should those be listed here so they're now listed, the yellow highlight shows that, and that appears to be, those are the changes that were made in that particular document, those were the requested changes to add those ITS projects in. Did I get that right, Teresa? Yes, she did, and, and of course there were some minor edits um, that we noted along the way, you know, grammar or punctuation or spelling. So those are not detailed in the highlighted versions? No. Okay. Like the issue about counties rather than boroughs? Right. <laughs> and I think we had the, I believe that was in this one that had the 5th Street instead of 5th Avenue. Yeah. So, so um, if you want to do each document separately, that's fine. If you want me to go through the changes in the status of the system as well and then do it all as one, that's your, your decision. If you don't mind, Madam Chair, my preference would be to do each of them individually. Okay. There no objection. The first one before us then is the congestion management process, process update. Can you approve the congestion management process update with, with the amendments? Madam Chair, as people are sort of uh, flipping through the uh, the changes, uh, I'd just like to speak a little bit generally. Mm -hmm. um, at our last discussion, um, Ms. Heil uh, explained that Projects that were uh, highlighted in this report were scored a little more highly. Could be uh, in the in the in the 
tip and the, and the step. Um, we, for the most part, we really don't have a project list in here. It does reference um, the MTP. And so, um, and I spent some time digging through to make sure <laughs> what was there and what wasn't. Uh, and, and so, uh, I don't think that actually is the case. Primarily deals with corridors and locations and, and strategies as opposed to specific projects. For example, um, it, uh, so this one, in my opinion, uh, doesn't have the effect of, of changing how the municipality or the state would rank a project as much as it does discuss how do we uh, address uh, specific methods for relieving congestion. And uh, I did communicate offline uh, with Mr. Lyon and with Ms. Heil about that. And I, think, I think we're all in accord to that, uh, on that subject. I, I only say that because I don't want someone to pull a couple lines on this document and say, yep, that's the project we have to do. <laughs> Madam Chair, may I help address that question? Um, mm -hmm. In the back of your paperwork on these highlighted documents, you'll see from the UPWP that we plan on doing a mid-term strategic plan to vet and look at implementing the current um, condition management strategies, and that would be under task 280 and 290, so that we can begin to implement some of these ideas. As you mentioned, these are more of a metrics to kind of figure out and strategies and mitigation measures to figure out what we're going to do, whereas that next step is to begin implementing some projects and vetting them out so that they'll be uh, ready for the tip and rank higher. Or I guess I'll be able to rank higher. Thank you, Teresa. Okay. Mr. Lee, did I mess up by not opening it up to the audience? Well, you have a motion, oh, we have but a you motion. Ha we don't have a second yet. But normally we, we would talk about it and then the public would okay. be invited to comment. So. You do have a motion on the floor. I can withdraw. I can do that as well. Your call. I did. She just withdrew it. Now, it, there we any go. questions or comments from the audience? Thank you. There being none, now let's back to the committee. Move to approve the congestion management process update. Second. <laughs> okay, moved by Ms. Heil, seconded by Mr. Flynn. Any further discussion? Any objection to approving the congestion management process update as, met, as modified by Stuff in Yellow? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, technical term. It's approved. <laughs> okay, then so next on the list is the status of the system report, right. Mr. Lyon. And so we had a number of questions uh, in this in this creature about uh, the the stuff in here about uh, a lot of transit stuff and some of the discussion about level of services and how did we get to H and all that sort of stuff. There's a on the third page of this shorter document. If you remember the the figure 2.6 did not have a legend, so we didn't know what the blue versus the red was. I guess that could be purple, but anyway, those two different colors, we didn't have a legend for those. Um, so we added that, and then there was a discussion again about, I believe it was ride share and those sorts of questions. We researched that, and Bart with uh, the Public Transportation Department gave us some, uh, some information there, which we've included here. And so that should clear up those questions for you, and if not, certainly ready to answer any questions you might have related to that sort of stuff. Um, so, happy to attempt to answer questions, or at least <coughs> those folks are. Madam <laughs> um, Chair, I'm happy to accept public comment and then make a motion. Okay. Anybody in the audience have any questions or comments regarding the status of the system report? 
Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, I move approval of the congestion management process update and status of the system report as amended. Second. Okay, moved by Mr. Flynn, seconded by Ms. <coughs> Pyle to approve the congestion management, no, excuse me, status of the system report as amended. I just want to say thank you to Teresa uh, for making the effort to look a little more specifically at the anchor rights issue. Um, I think that's going to be an ongoing challenge for us in our public transit um, system and how we manage those trips, whether it's through anchor rides or some other uh, methodology. And I think we need to keep a close eye on that as, as our population continues to age a bit, you know, even in my family. Everybody has. <laughs> Beats the alternative. Uh, where's the phone number for anchor? Yeah, it, it's definitely a need that's not going to go away. So, any further discussion? Okay, anybody object to approving the congestion management plan as amended? Okay, so Appreciate it. That's the last uh, thing that is sitting open on our. Uh, certification review so we can report to FHWA and FTA now and get that closed and we'll be good to go. Well done. Thank you. Okay, now we're on to general information. Uh, three items. The first one is the MTP update. Mr. Warren. Madam Chair, at the last uh, meeting in uh, January, uh, Ms. Heil asked for an update, kind of a status on where we are with our, our uh, efforts for the update to the MTP. As you know, we did an interim update just recently, and we still have the what we'll call the full-blown update rolling along as scheduled. So the schedule is before you with this item 6A. Um, if you have specific questions, we can answer that. But basically, we are waiting for, um, for final approval. It's in final agency review with uh, DOT and the MOA. And we should be, uh, I hope we should be getting that fairly soon and get ready to get an RFP out on the street. We, uh, we need to have that approved by November 19th of 2019, and clearly we have a decent amount of time, and we certainly hope to get it approved well before that, but that's why we're starting early, so we make sure we have enough time. Yeah, yes. Questions? Ms. Heil. Just, so I know there's a lot of items that were the basis of the MCP, so can you remind me, is the model done now and calibrated and ready to go? The model is not finished and calibrated, but Ms. Brewer can answer um, details on that. We added a task to the scope of work, and so um, they will be doing an additional scenario without the Kinecon bridge. So our schedule for the travel demand model is summer, this summer. Um, the validation and calibration report will probably be prepared shortly. So we're getting closer. We have all the other building blocks on the public model plan our basic one is out for public comment now. What other big blocks are there? It was the ITS architecture and the congestion management process that we just approved. Yeah, so the last, is that the last of it? That's it. We need the model. So as soon as the model's done and we have the, um, the contractor on board, this should be full steam ahead at that point? That's the plan. Yeah. When's, <laughs> when's the RFP for the contractor going to be put on the street well we again it's at DOT right now for their final approval uh, and as soon as we get that back and I think Vivian what did you the work with OEO oh well they did approve the language in the, in the RFP for <coughs> uh, DBE language and um, it's in the operating agreement that the DOT and PF does approve the scope of work for any tours that we do so um, that's why it's important that we get that done. We're, we've been working with them continuously since August on this, but uh, people have been in and out of town. So I'm sure that we'll get that. that soon. Give, give me a wild guess. How soon, do, Mr. Lyon, do we expect the municipality of Anchorage will issue an RFP? <laughs> if you get the approval from DOT next week, then yeah. We should have a contractor on board. Well, I'd like to have a contractor on board in, in April. Okay. Unless there's other work out there. Yeah. All right. 
Pete, that's going to be your job to fix because I'm going to be gone before this is done. <laughs> <laughs> no. well, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. The next item is the. Oh, any other questions of those in the audience for our MTP update? Okay, Ms. Ryan, the quarterly obligation report. <laughs> so this is the first quarter obligation report. Again, the, the TIP funds, these federal funds are on the federal fiscal year. So that starts October 1. So that uh, first quarter is through the, uh, the end of December. So typically we don't have a lot of money obligated in that uh, first quarter. In this case, we have money for Abbott Road obligated. The Minnesota Drive Mobility and Safety Study has been obligated. Um, and a few things in the non-motorized category uh, have some partial obligations already. Um, we are tracking fairly well. Um, we're, we don't have, I mean, it's early, but we certainly don't have anything at this point that we have scheduled for the 2016 uh, year obligation that we have any thoughts that it won't go. So um, there's really not much to report since we're, it's so, so uh, early in the, in the game, but we are clearly within that plus or minus 15% that we need to be at the end of the first quarter because we're right at zero. We're right there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we need to amend to remind them I've been remiss and haven't really followed up on, on developing some sort of policy for AMATS around the use of AC, advanced construction. And so um, I'd like to make a request of Mr. Lyon to give me a, a history of the level of advanced construction dollars that we have used for the last, what's, what's a good term, maybe seven years? Some <laughs> <laughs> um, just so we have a, a feel for sort of, and then, and then the actual funding available. Uh, and of course, the percentage there. I, I can do the ratio myself, but if you want to do it okay. for me, I wouldn't mind. Okay. Um, I I just like us as a policy committee to have a conversation around that and, and think if we want to set uh, an upward limit on a percentage basis um, going forward. I don't mind the use of AC. I understand the purpose behind it, but I also get a little bit nervous that sometimes we're a little too aggressive in that regard and are mortgaging our future of excessive. So, okay, so, um, we'll do it. Yeah, if you can bring us an information item next month mm -hmm. and then we can talk a little bit about what we want, actually want to do, that'd be great. We're going to be off of paying that a month after that, but you never know. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can come as a public citizen. There you go. Chair. <laughs> it's been about 18 million, hasn't it? It's not about what it's been, 18 million? It's, it, it varies. It varies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's fluctuating. It, the purpose, just for edification of the newer members, um, the reason you use AC dollars is if um, things don't get expended, then the you have in other areas where you are expending so that you are using your full allocation yeah. in a given fiscal year. So the reason for doing it. The, the cautionary note is if you overdo it, you then you've got a real problem the next year when you don't have enough money to go around. Yeah. And so that's that's the conversation I want to have. And if if I may, if the committee would indulge me, if I could set aside my AMATS hat and put on my DOT hat. Mm -hmm. um, another part of that, and the reason it's been used so much, is, is because the cost of the projects are so high. It wasn't all that long ago, probably, Craig, it was probably 10 years ago, Eight or ten years ago, we had AMATS had a much larger pot. It was about forty million dollars a, a year. Now we're twenty and, something. And now that as we're advancing these projects that that require long lead times, they're so expensive to get them the, uh, moved forward. And so it's been a tool that has been used, um, and we use it a lot on the state side too to give you some flexibility if something should slip. And actually, I think our next presentation will be one of those examples where. Um, uh, we have a, a need that we don't have a, an ability to meet right now um, within the constraints of our TIP. So, yes, it, but it would be good and we can work with, DOT will work with 
Greg, to, to get the information um, so it's clearly understood so that, uh, and, and it could very well be that we need to do smaller projects. That, that's another thing to talk about. Thank you, I'll, I'll step out of my deep <laughs> go back to the match. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, any other questions from the audience on the obligation part? It will be much more interesting, I think, in the next quarter as we start getting Stop money that. spent. <laughs> okay, Mr. Lyon, uh, Rabbit Creek Road presentation. Okay, so uh, we had a presentation on this project, uh, projects, etc., uh, at the TAC. And uh, Sean Baskey with DOT will present now, but just to uh, uh, ahead of time let you know that when the TAC heard this presentation, and as, as he goes through it, you'll understand kind of what we're looking at. Um, the TAC asked us to look at the tip, which is the 2015 to 18 tip right now, um, where there really isn't any funds to do some of the things that he's mentioning in here, and look at the possibility of adding a 2019 year or other kind of things that we can do to to try and move some of these important projects and certainly some of the ones you mentioned uh, <coughs> into the funded portion of our program. So we will start that process here to see what we might be able to do to move things up. So I'm pretty sure you know I'd rather see some work done on highway to highway first. I would like Sean to see highway to highway. Nothing personal there, Sean. Just add it to the pile. <laughs> All right, first. Thank you to the committee for allowing me to come in and share this informational item. So, see there, Rabbit Creek Road Improvements Project Overview. So why are we here, right? I mean, why are we here talking about it? my project, which is just a pavement preservation project? Well, it's not just that. There's a lot of need on Rabbit Creek Road. So, pavement preservation project, as Mr. Lyon shared, is funded out of the pavement line item out of the tip, which has a severely limited uh, amount of money associated with it and it doesn't align well with you know the overall uh, funding picture for delivering a project in the near future assuming that the needs are there which I would share later on so I'm also going to cover the other Rabbit Creek Road projects that we have on the books or in the planning future and then open it up to you know it's just an informational item so let's just cover the project area. Rabbit Creek Road, as we know it, um, the specific project area would be Old Seward Highway up to Hillside Drive and DeArmond Road. There's a number of features along the road, but it's a 12-foot lane, 6-foot shoulder. The 6-foot shoulders are the accommodations for pedestrians and bicyclists along the whole route. As far as functional classification, it's a minor arterial for the bottom segment down here that brings you up to Golden View, and at Golden View, it moves into a major collector. As you would expect with that, the ADTs on the bottom portion of the project, so Rabbit Creek Road from Old Seward Highway up to Golden View Drive. Excuse me, define ADTs? Sure. So the average daily traffic or the average annual daily traffic so it's a measure of overall traffic along the corridor. This one um, is, you know, at the bottom end of the road, you know, 7,000 to 10,000 vehicles along that stretch in any given day. And then up towards the top, you move down to a lower uh, number. At Golden View Road, you can see that we've got 1,900 vehicles a day on Golden View. All right. As far as significant facilities along the roadway, we've got Station 10 up at the top, we've got Bear Valley Elementary School, and we've got Golden View Middle School as the significant feature along Golden View Drive. As far as the overall condition of the road, there's severe, severe rutting and some extremely um, extreme degradation of the overall pavement structure. So you can see an example here of some major cracking, which is signs of the overall you know, uh, structure of the roadway just deteriorating beyond immediate maintenance ability to go in and maintain anything. So as far as pavement rutting, you'll see here that down here in the in 
in the index, we've got a, nearly three quarters of an inch or more rutting associated with this lower section. This little, this is the hill that everybody knows whenever you see a um, a report where uh, we've got a lot of icing. The news crews immediately go out to that one hill, and you'll find people in the ditch, and they'll be reporting all about that. So. That hill is associated with our largest rutting area. Another hill right here just east of Golden View Drive has another severe rutting problem. We also have drainage issues. Culverts are getting clogged with water and ice. We have ditch glaciation as you can see here where the water comes down the hill, freezes in the ditch, then comes down the hill freezes it in the ditch until it overtops the ditch and then spills out over onto the roadway in a number of different areas. And anytime you have water up near the top of your pavement, you've got pavement issues. So we've got degradation of the overall pavement and frost heaving that occurs because of those items. Uh, of the roadway or uh, frost heaving of the roadway or, or the both driveways and of the roadway in different areas. Go back a couple slides to the uh, what, um, you've indicated that the hills are the location of the most severe rutting. Yes, sir. Um, I presume the road that is more or less the same quality uniform throughout the length of the road? It would be expected that during the construction they would have used the same basic materials. Okay. So, just for argument's sake, if we're, <laughs> no, it's too late for that. <laughs> Statute of limitations has already passed. We worked on tort reform. Um, <laughs> Um, how would you redo the roadbed to mitigate the rutting on the steeper sections of the road should we find the funding for it? Sure. Excellent question through the chair. Ultimately, you know, a lot of that degradation or the, the rutting is likely due to sliding and um, wear from studs and similar kinds of actions, right? So there are some options that the Department of Transportation or you know uh, different agencies use, which is something uh, called hard aggregate. This road does not reach the level that would require hard aggregate, which would have a longer sustained life than a, a typical aggregate that we get you know, from the valley. Those come at a much higher cost and are used only in select locations. What's the criteria for selection? Sure. So the department, through the chair, the department chooses to use a 5,000 ADT per lane, which would require a 10,000 ADT, but also has other opportunities to use uh, a harder aggregate in select uh, circumstances. The determination about when to use a hard aggregate depends on the traffic rather than on the, on the road condition itself. Road geography, I think, is the road Th Through the chair, the, the selection to use a harder aggregate is generally used on a higher level road, which then, because it is a much higher cost to use that hard aggregate, it has to be shipped in either from, you know, Washington, from Canada or in a select one select location along the the rail belt. Okay, turn, 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 turn around and look at the back of the wall <laughs> and wave to Tim Sullivan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a, gra a a granite quarry that can provide you with outstanding <laughs> aggregate out of out of Curry, uh, far better than you'll get out of the valley, and. So it doesn't need to be shipped from Washington. I, I, I mean, this is the sort of thing that gets me exercised. Sure. Because we, 
try to do stuff on the cheap, and then we end up paying for it over and over again, and we sacrifice other projects because we don't do these ones right. It's, it makes a little bit of camp to do in a building code based on the number of occupants rather than quality of the building, isn't it? it if I may ask the question, I mean, one of the, the, the challenges we have is how old the pavement is. I mean, it's history. But, but we're talking about the ultimate factor is the roadbed. That's what makes the difference. You can patch a lot if you have a good roadbed. But if you have a bad roadbed, you're never going to fix it. You know, I have a, a perfect uh, uh, visual. I, I have a, a, a section. No, no. I, <laughs> I have a cross section of a road that was taken out that shows the ruts that show it as a, truly the grinding down of the pavement and not of the the substructure of the road itself. And so. Uh, as we'll find here, moving forward, it, I mean, this was last paved in 1998, and and payment generally try to get a good 10 years out of it, and so it's it's. Um, it's a hit. I see. Do something like that to put in the pavement. Yeah, and we do see often. I, I live in Eagle River, and Eagle River um, Loop Road uphill. The uphill part is wearing out, and we just paid that probably seven, eight years ago. It's getting some ruts because of it again. Um, so, if it, so if you, so if you, my point is, if you need hard material, talk to your cousins over at the railroad. They got lots of it. Curry quarry is loaded with it. And, and I guess it's my, my point is. Um, the city and the state, we spend a lot of money repairing roads, and if the determination is based on the amount of traffic rather than the road geography, um, then perhaps we ought to reevaluate the criteria uh, used to, to, to specify um, material. Material, because it's probably cheaper in the long run to build a good road, regardless of the traffic flow looks like some of the best of it. Thought on that. Madam Chair. Eric, someone waved their arm back there. Uh, we have uh, Mr. DeSantis. Yeah, I wanted to mention that the hard aggregate is for pavement, it's for the asphalt surface, which is the wearing course. And so we find much increased wear from studded tires. So that's why the ADT relates directly to whether we would use hard aggregate or not. It's not the subgrade as Ms. Witt mentioned. It's strictly for wearing purposes. And could you give your your <coughs> yeah, background? Yeah, Eric I'm with the Committee on Crossing, and uh, for the past uh, 20 years, I've been with Central Region, mostly in construction, with uh, sort of the emphasis on asphalt for that. So, what are the con? <coughs> what are the contents of hard aggregate? It's a degradation value that we can only find in uh, three locations in Alaska which is why we tend to import it. Um, it's easier, less expensive to bring it up, the contractors have found, from Washington than to uh, import it from other places in Alaska. Where do you find it? Denali is one source. There's another re another source up in northern region and one off an island near Kodiak. What's the content? What is it? I'm sorry, what's that? What is it? What kind of rock are we talking about? It's, a, it's a strictly a degradation value. It's how much it wears when put in a, basically a washing machine and shaking around with metal balls. Done that. Everybody? <laughs> 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 no, I, mean, I used to use uh, the balls they used for mining operations. Same, same. Sorry for the digression. <laughs> no problem. All right, as part of the pavement preservation project, we went out to the community councils and received comments from the public. And one of the comments was, we've got a safety concern in the corridor. We hear that comment on nearly every project, but let's look at the safety numbers. So from 2008 to 2012, we looked at three different 
sections of the roadway. So Old Seward Highway to Elmore Road, Elmore Road to Golden View Drive, and then the top end of the hill from Golden View Drive up to Hillside Drive. So you'll see the break in the classification, as we mentioned before, from arterial to collector. Now the statewide average rate uh, for crashes is shown here, which is based off of the classification of the road. Now this, these rates are in 100 crashes per 100 million vehicle miles traveled. You'll see that we are slightly over the statewide average for a portion of the road from Old Seward Highway to Elmore Road. We are well below the statewide average from the section from Elmore to Golden View Drive. And then we are again above the average based off of the classification once you get above Golden View Drive. Here's the number of accidents associated with, you, with each of those segments during that study period. I always like to share my story because each one of these crashes has a story associated with it. My wife was in a minor injury accident a number of years ago and at that time she was not able to pick up my one-year-old child which severely affected our family. Each one of those people that come in and comments about whatever story they have on the crashes you know, carries some significance. And we always like to you know, go in and really analyze and, and pay attention to each one of those stories. Now, you'll see that we only have minor injury accidents, we don't have major injuries, and we don't have fatalities. As a result, this section of Golden or uh, Rabbit Creek Road does not land within the top 100 projects on the HSIP list of you know, top 100. And HSIP stands for? Highway Safety Improvement Program Thank you. for the Department of Transportation. So we do have three different projects associated with the Rabbit <coughs> Creek Road area. We've got Golden View Drive intersection which you guys have he heard in other presentations. That was part of the Anchorage Hillside intersection study. We also have a uh, two-way left turn lane from the bottom of the hill up to Golden View Drive, which is in the MTP, is project number 142, I believe. And then, of course, my project, the AMATS pavement, Rabbit Creek Road Pavement Preservation Project, which is in the TIP. So first, let's just rehash the Golden View Drive intersection upgrades project. We do have 33 crashes from 2000 to 2010 at that intersection. The crash rate of 1.38 crashes per million entering vehicles is approximately double that of the statewide average for an intersection of that type and character. Rabbit Creek Road at that point has a ADT or you know, traffic associated with it of 5,400 vehicles per day. And Golden View Drive has 1,300 at that point. Now, the expectation is that Golden View Drive will increase due to the development in the area to overcome that of Rabbit Creek Road east of that intersection. So eventually the main thoroughfare will become that right turn or that left turn movement, depending on where you're at, onto Golden View Drive from Rabbit Creek Road. So we'll see a shift in the demand in the area based on development. And of course there's a concern for the congestion when school uh, opens up in the morning and we've got commuter traffic coming down the hill and that conflict between the two. How does that conflict? They're going opposite directions. Sure, so you've got commuter traffic coming down the hill, you've got uh, Golden View Middle School located down here, and so when the parents or school buses need to exit that facility, then they'll come up to Rabbit Creek Road, need to take a left turn move, which then conflicts with the people coming down the hill. They have to look for gaps because it is a stop control on the minor lakes, which is Golden View Drive at this, end, at this point. Did you look at signalizing the intersection? Absolutely. So that brings us to the alternatives that were looked at. There was a number of alternatives round, ranging from roundabouts to nothing to signalizing to all kinds of different things. 
quickly show you some 30,000 foot level views of the different looks that were taken. You've got a severe grade coming down the, the hill or a less desirable grade coming down the hill, which moves you into potentially relocating the intersection away from it so that way you have a more desirable grade coming into the intersection. Of course, those have much bigger right-of-way impacts and environmental impacts associated with them. Other alternatives that were looked at? And finally, the preferred alternative, which was a realigned intersection and a roundabout moved south of the existing intersection. The estimated cost of that was at $12.4 million. Currently, it is unfunded, not in the MTP as well. Uh, the Department of Transportation plans on submitting it as an HSIP project later this year, but that does not guarantee that it will be accepted <coughs> or funded through the HSIP program. HSIP. Highway yeah. Safety Improvement yeah. Program. But, Madam Chair, remind me, that wouldn't affect the AMAPS allocation if it comes through HSIP, right? That, that is correct. If it's, that would be outside or in addition to, and you see at that level of funding, if AMAPS only gets about $24 million a year, That'd be half of one year's worth. So there's no opportunity cost for doing this project as opposed to maybe something that's higher up the list? Correct. Not to AMATS. However, HSIP dollars are also concerned <coughs> in sort of maybe some other HSIP project that we would like within the nature of coal that may not happen if this goes forward. Is there actually going to be the development uh, further down Roanoke Drive? It seems to me that's been proposed forever. Commissioners' uh, development of some sort, uh, and I thought that there were some real restrictions there in terms of doing that. And therefore, the projections might be a little off in terms of that. That just got referred to the planning board, so we don't know. It actually, it, Sean, regarding the Highway Safety Improvement Program, does this intersection at Rabbit Creek at Golden View fall within that top 100 statewide, or is that what has to be looked at to see if it could compete for those funds? I'm not sure exactly where it ranks out, but it will not do well on its own if not looked at. It's high cost, because it, it, for the <coughs> committee, if you could just explain a little bit about the need for positive cost benefit for the sure surely we want to improve all intersections or all you know segments of roadways but the HSIP program the highway safety improvement program uses a nomination uh, methodology for you know what is the cost of the project what are the potential uh, reductions in in accidents and so that's the basic level you know, there's a lot of other things that go into it, but what is the cost per saved life is, you know, would be the 30,000 foot level view of what the HSIP program is about. There's a lot of other things that we could spend probably two hours talking about. So it is very much data driven. Correct. That's why you did the analysis. Okay, thank you. I would I actually have a question. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> do you happen to know how many properties would, would uh, have to be acquired uh, in order to to do this recommended alternative through the chair I, I could provide that information this project was not my project so I'm not ultimately familiar with it we we can absolutely provide that information um, it obviously does impact a number of different properties and there are two uh, properties in particular that I believe um, there was some major uh, public comment associated with it. <laughs> <laughs> I would also quickly point out that the Department of Transportation has not neglected this intersection. In 2014, we constructed an overhead uh, beacon at the intersection, was, which is expected uh, to reduce the overall number of accidents at the intersection. But that data, which would have you know, benefited <coughs> from or the, the reduction in accidents would, which would have resulted in uh, less accidents at the intersection is not in the analysis that was done for this study which was completed last year. All right? No, no, no this, is, uh, this whole thing is information. Right. So the second project 
uh, which I mentioned, which is in the MTP, is adding a two-way left turn lane from the bottom of the hill at Old Seward Highway up to Golden View Drive. There are a number of intersections and private driveways that intersect the roadway where people are, you know, sitting in the, in the through lane, waiting to get across, waiting for a gap. And so this project is slated or is projected to reduce those, those accidents. The highest crash numbers are obviously at the larger or more uh, frequented intersections of Elmore and down at Old Seward Highway. As far as the benefits of adding a two-way left turn lane, which comes at a great expense, as I mentioned before, there are a number of accidents, but there are also not a lot of fatalities and um, major injuries, which is a good thing, right? But as a project nomination, it doesn't pencil out really well for you know a huge reduction in overall cost to society, right? You want to reduce the overall number of fatalities and major injuries. Well, this, because you're just eliminating some of the minor injury crashes, which are significant, of course, and the run off the road where the vehicle is just damaged, it doesn't pencil out real well for major reductions in the cost to society. The project scope is adding a two-way left turn lane, adding a separated pedestrian pathway with a bike lane shown on the one on the two sides and then the overall cost which the Department of Transportation rehashed in 2014 is approximately 28 million dollars 3 million dollars for right-of-way and 2.4 million dollars for utilities that's all included in the 27.6 in the MTP you'll see a much smaller cost estimate than that which is shown here because this is a refined cost estimate the MTP was long-term list or the illustrative list? It was in the short term. And it is actually, that's one of the things we've got the technical committee has staff to, to evaluate because the longer term MTP improvement, which is in the short term recommendations, has a, is, is the last one that had, had made the cut for a new start. And the question that has been posed to staff is, does it make sense to advance that one? Should we consider replacing it with this type of improvement or to look at how to fund it. Would that be a major amendment or a minor amendment? Uh, major, major amendment. You're adding a new project. So is it? Okay. We just ignore it. It's probably the simpler way to do it. But Somehow I thought that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that might come up. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. no, I just, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that's not going to get funded, yes. even in the short term list, if you just don't fund it. Yes then you can deal with it when you do the MTP rewrite, which is what we're doing right now. So. Which brings you finally to the payment preservation project, which is my project. Um, you know, obviously we discussed the significant running and the drainage issues. The overall improvements or the scope of the project is looking to basically remove the asphalt, replace the asphalt, do a select dig outs at certain locations to, you know, basically go in where we need to to give the pavement life it need, what it needs for the future. To, to make that subsurface stronger. Right. There's a number of areas that, you know, without doing some work below the pavement, you're not going to get that much life out of the pavement above it. So, But those are very selective. We're also doing some upgrade to the drainage systems in two very select locations where we have that glaciation of the water coming over top of the road due to you know a lot of water coming down the hill but not having any means to go subsurface or below ground. And then replacing some guardrail and replacing some signs. <coughs> so there is the cost of the pavement preservation project, $7.8 million. And then there's a rehash of all the costs. I would quickly mention, which I neglected to mention, that this last year in 2015, the Department of Transportation, even in its current fiscal situation, um, elected to do a skim coat overlay of the worst section, so that hill that you saw right here, 
The Department of Transportation skim coated the asphalt using maintenance dollars um, from Old Seward Highway up to Elmore Road, only in the uphill direction because it was that bad. So the Department of Transportation realizes the needs that the community has there and tried to address them even in their you know, fiscally constrained times. That's. Yes. So on the drainage issue, um, how did how, if at all, were you <coughs> able to integrate the hillside district plan, which looked pretty comprehensively at drainage issues on the hillside, uh, into <coughs> your research on this specific roadway? Sure. Excellent question. Through the chair, the ultimately a pavement preservation project is not intended to be a drainage improvement project. We looked at the most severe needs for drainage along that corridor and tried to address those because those were the ones that were causing the most severe uh, degradation of the pavement by bringing water to the near surface and overtopping the road which requires our maintenance crews to go out and, and deal with the icing across the road and, and sanding and all that. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I understand you're constrained based on project protocol. Um, the reason I raise the issue is I mean, the entire hillside is flowing downhill. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> and, and, and so if you fix you know, spot one or spot two or spots one and two, you're just pushing the problem further down the hill. And it may or may not at that point be a DOT problem. But I, but I think we need to be looking at this a little more comprehensively uh, in that, OK, where's the water coming from and where does it need to go so that we're coordinating efforts, kind of like we're supposed to be doing with utility underground, it doesn't really matter for another day. Uh, <laughs> um, and so I would encourage you to at least look through some of that data and, and if, if this project moves to fruition, mm -hmm. specific to the glaciation aspect of it, look a little bit further beyond the project boundaries and how we might bring other resources to bear to manage the water better. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a significant issue out there. As Mr. Steele said, not my district, but, <laughs> but but still something I would like to see us be thinking a little bit more broadly about. I have more opinion than this question, I guess. But. <laughs> okay, is this the end of your That is it. The end of the information. So that's just a summary of the overall projects and the associated costs that are on the table for the projects that the Department of Transportation had in on the books or in previous planning efforts. And if I may, uh, for the policy committee members, if you will take a look at your first quarter obligation report. And the reason that the technical committee referred it back to staff is if you look at the, um, the first page, the Pavement replacement program, which is the third project down. You see that right now there is zero dollars um, probably programmed even at this point because um, it was a seed last year to Eagle River Road. And so that was one of the other things. We had Eagle River Road repaved, it was much more expensive than what we had in one year's worth of funding, so we advanced this year's funding to last year. And so we have, however, several projects that have started design, this being one, in, one of them, that uh, is a challenge that as we look at, given the, the policy and procedures that we have in place that looks at, I think it's 15 to 20 percent, is it, for a pavement replacement program, it's still not a whole lot when you have only $24 million a year. So, it's one of the things that I, th I think, Mr. Planet, ties into your, your concerns <coughs> and comments about um, the AC program. A lot of it is being driven, if you will, by the size of the projects. And so it's a, a 
it's a challenge that we've we're going to let staff come up with some recommendations. <laughs> I often tell people who come to me and say, hey, I'd really like to get this road built repaired or whatever. Can you get something through me? And I encourage them to find any other fun source they can possibly As do I. I represent that next to Yeah, I, I, I get it. Well, thank you. Is there any questions from the audience for Ms. Baskey? Any other comments from just, the committee? I would just, in, a great great report. Um, I would just really look and see if we can, as I said, we, I actually got charged back many, many years ago when trying to market granite <laughs> that the railroad pulls out of Curry. It's good material. If there's a way we can use it for surfacing that uh, reduces long-term maintenance, I would love to see that happen and I would add uh, that uh, I believe it was the city of Chicago uh, redefined uh, their road standards uh, so that uh, they were reducing the ongoing maintenance and they're building their roads harder. It was part of their sustainability initiative, looked at climate change and all sorts of things. And then they, they're 10 years ahead of us on this. So I, I, I'd like to see a little more consideration, uh, not specific to this project, but generally, and how we're, how we're harming our roads. We're, we're getting wetter and wetter. <laughs> Better start doing something about it. That's Okay. Uh, any other comments or questions? Well, thank you. Tom. And good luck, Craig. Yay. <laughs> okay, now it's a chance for around the room. Any comments from the committee? Mr. Peterson? Mr. Steele? Uh, no comments. Mr. Quinn? That's all right. <laughs> And um, the only thing that I would mention is that you have also on your, uh, for your use, is a, a, a snapshot from the Navigator. And I encourage people to, um, as you are going out <coughs> this island, to enjoy your favorite spots that requires you to go over state, especially the state highway system, is to take a look at um, the Navigator online, and uh, which is updated regularly to show road closures and where projects are going to be. But this gives a good snapshot of what is out there. Um, anticipated for construction this summer, and there is a lot. Uh, Central Region has had a, a very, very robust, I want to say, obligation of federal funds last year that will be seeing construction this summer. So that's all I had to add. And then, Mr. Kemp, uh, should I pleasure being here next next month. Ms. Hyman. Okay, Craig. Anything else for the good uh, order? We do have a public comments request. So I don't, oh, know, I don't know if there are any, but we just make sure we ask. Thank you for keeping me on. Are there any comments from the public? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, two projects that. You got to tell us your name, Tom. My name is Tom McGrath, <laughs> and uh, been involved here in Anchorage for 40 years. But, uh, two projects that uh, are in, of interest to me right now is the Spinard Road at uh, Minnesota. Um, we started talking about that in the 80s when they built, rebuilt Spinard Road. And in the 90s, they came up with a couplet idea. Uh, and it's been floated at various meetings, various times, never been done. Right now, Cook Inlet Housing is starting a $30 million project at Spinard 36. And then on the old Vagabond trailer site, uh, somebody's talking about 600 residential units, which is just that much more impact for that intersection. In Spinard at the Spinard Community Council, we call it the billion dollar intersection because we spent a billion dollars as a community in oil and time at that intersection. You know, um, it just, everybody was. The other one is the highway to highway. Seven, eight years ago, you built the highway to highway building on 15th. Uh, and I think that you inversely condemned the property from 5th to 15th Gamble to Ingra. Um, I walked 
from 9th to 15th this morning, just a what have I, what I haven't, haven't I seen lately? I'll never do it again. <laughs> I was so afraid. I thought I was going to die. Uh, the sidewalks are very narrow. They're all very icy. Uh, the traffic's at 50 miles an hour. And um, you know, sometimes you have to look at what's the cost-benefit ratio. And people, like we voted to bond for Elmore Road here a number of years ago. <coughs> Citizens and people get it. If, if you can show the benefit, they would vote for a state bond to do the highway to highway. I know it's a billion dollars, but we're probably spending that every year on lost productivity in Anchorage. And you know, in one light, they're at 13. If you could just take out that light and speed up the traffic that much more. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's a major impediment to business in that corridor. And I think it's really hurting that corridor. And Mr. Flynn represents that area. You know, all of the effort that's been going on, or been accomplished by the Fairview Community Council and the business community. And uh, I would just encourage you to, to look at it in other ways. Maybe there's, maybe AMATS isn't the proper way to look at it. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Then it's 2.40 and meeting's adjourned. Thank you.